we're going to finish section 4.2 today, prime and composite numbers. And we had left off on the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And the fundamental theorem of arithmetic says the following. Each composite number can be written as a product of primes in one and only one way. Except perhaps you could order the primes in a different way. We could switch the order, you know, so like... Six can be written as three times two or two times three. We're going to call that the same, or, the same thing, okay? It's the same list of prime numbers, just in a different order, okay? But you can't do six as any other primes besides two and three. There's nothing else that would work. Um, and this is another really good reason why we really, really don't want the number one to be considered a prime number. Because if the number one were actually a prime number, this fundamental theorem of arithmetic would be false. Because I could actually write down that 6 is 2 times 3. Or I could write down that 6 is 1 times 2 times 3. Or that 6 is 1 squared times 2 times 3. And I would have infinitely many ways of writing that. And that would be not so good, right? So that's another sort of um, reason that the 1 being a prime is not being a prime is a very good thing for us. Okay, there's one and only one way um, in which to break down a number into prime factors. All right, so another cool feature about divisors is that if you have a divisor D of a number N, then the number N divided by D is also divisor of the original number N. So I'm going to give you an example with numbers, and you'll be like, well, yeah, of course that works. So let's just do the number 24. And I'd like for you to give me one divisor of 24. 6. Okay, so 6 divides 24, right? But also, what is 24 divided by 6? 4. 4 will also divide 24, right? All this theorem is saying is that these numbers occur in pairs. If you find a divisor, you've actually found two divisors. Now, it could be that the divisor is the same thing. Like, Let's say you had 36, and you said 6 is a divisor of 36, and you're like, okay, well, what's the pair that goes with 6? Well, it's itself. It's not very exciting, right? It doesn't really yield anything we didn't already know. But it does occur in pairs. I mean, it is 6 times 6 equals 36. It is another divisor that would work out to being in this same sort of description. But this theorem is just saying these, these divisors occur in pairs, okay? The next one looks a little bit funny, but it's actually a really, really helpful piece of information. These next couple of them, actually. It says if n is a composite number, then n has a prime factor p such that p squared is less than or equal to n. Okay. You might say, okay, why do I care? Well, what this does is it eliminates you having to test prime factors that go up too high. So if you started with a number that you didn't know if it was prime or composite, say 751. Okay, well, I can test it's not divisible by 2. It's not divisible by 3 because I'm starting to add them up and it doesn't work. Obviously not divisible by 5, and we can keep going. But the question is, when do I stop? How do I know I've gone far enough? I mean, I certainly don't want to get all the way up to 751. I don't even know all the primes that high. How do I know when to stop? Well... The way you know when to stop is that you actually, and this is what theorem 416 says, if n is a whole number and uh, bigger than 1, and it's not divisible by any prime numbers like this, then it's prime. So how do you know when to stop? Well, let's take my 751 as an example. Actually, let me write it differently. Ah, get it in there, 751. What you do is you actually take the square root of the 751. So somebody grab a calculator for us. What is the square root of 751? I totally made that number off off the top of my head too, so that's why I don't have you written down. You were close to me. <coughs> square root of 751. <coughs> it shouldn't, I hope it's not an actual whole number, is it? 27.4. Fabulous. Okay. 27 point, what'd you say? Four something? Okay, that's fine, 27.4. What this tells us is that I only need to test the prime numbers until I get to 27.4. I don't have to test them very high, do I? I really don't. I mean, 751, I mean, I would have gone further than that if I didn't know this theorem. I would have kept going beyond 27. This tells me how far I have to go. 
So if we were looking at this number, 967, is 967 what your paper, paper actually says? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. It didn't usually say that. 967, and we're wanting to test that it's prime. What is the biggest prime number that we would possibly have to test? So we're going to take the square root. What do you get when you take the square root of 967? An approximation with one decimal is plenty. What do you get? 31.1. Okay, so 31.1. What is the small what is the largest prime number smaller than 31.1? 29 is one. Is it this is it the largest one though? 31 itself actually works, isn't it? So 31 would be the largest prime that we would possibly have to test. Now, if we're testing numbers and 7 works, we may never get to 31, right? But if we're testing numbers and they keep not working, the largest number I have to test to qualify and say, yep, none of them work, would be 31. Okay, y'all with me? This tells us where we get to stop testing when we don't know if a number's prime or not. All right. Oh, I already mentioned this, so this is uh, unfortunate. It says, show that if one were considered a prime number, every number would have more than one prime factorization. I already did that, didn't I? Yeah, so let's see. We're going to use example 15. What is the prime factorization for 15? 3 times 5. If 1 were considered a prime number, what would be another prime factorization? Fantastic. And we could keep going in this way for infinitely many times, right? All we'd have to do is to just keep using larger and larger exponents on the number 1. So we would have, say, for instance, 1 squared times 3 times 5. We'd have 1 cubed times 3 times 5. And we could do this infinitely many times. All right. Our next example is going to show how we can think about um, these factors occurring in pairs. Mr. Arbor wants to plant apple trees in a rectangular array. If he has 36 saplings, find all the possible numbers of rows if each row is to have the same number of trees. So I will start you out with the hardest one. Actually, it's not the hardest, but it's the one people usually forget. We could have one row, so let's put down here rows and trees. We could have one row with 36 trees, and that would actually fit this description, wouldn't it? It almost feels silly, but it fits the description. What would be the next option if we sort of try to do this in an organized way? Two rows with 18 trees. What else could we have? Three rows with 12 trees. What else could we have? Four rows with nine trees. What else could we have? Yeah, six rows with six trees. And we could take this list and we could reverse it all as well, right? We could technically have nine rows with four trees, but nine rows with four trees is the same as four rows with nine trees, agreed? All right, so we've really gotten all of the options, and that's exactly what it asked us to find. Find all possible numbers of rows. Well, technically, it's all of these numbers, right? All of these numbers are possible rows of trees. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 9, 12, 18, and 36. Oh, yeah, and there's six in there twice. That's why it's not occurring in an even number of them. It's because six times six isn't there. Any question on that one? And if you write it down kind of in that order, the pairs show up naturally, don't they? I mean, like, I didn't have to get at some point and think, oh, yeah, there was 12 as an option as well. It was already there because I put them in pairs when I created my list. Okay. All right, one last question. Bob says that to check whether a number is prime, he just has to use the divisibility rules he knows for 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 10. 
He says if a number is not divisible by these numbers, then it's prime. How do you respond? There's so many things we need to tell Bob. Somebody tell me one of them. Poor Bob. Is that that's what you want to tell Melissa? <laughs> what would you tell Mamie? Okay, so tell me one thing that's wrong with his idea, Hannah. Just one. Okay. Three is the prime number. Uh-huh. And saying that it is not divisible by it. It has to be divisible by something. Probably five is the number the same way. I don't know if that makes sense. But um, not quite. Try again for me. Okay, he said if it's not divisible by these numbers, then it's not. Correct. So it would have to have a three. Uh-huh. But then that means it would that would be it wouldn't fit this criteria. He's saying if he takes a number and he divides it by these and none of these actually go into his number, then it's a prime number. Oh. Do you see what he's saying a little bit differently now? Okay, Amy, what do you think? I say like it can be a multiple of seven, multiple of thirteen. Okay, so that's one problem is that there are numbers that are not included in this list, right? So I should say there are prime numbers. I'm sorry. Let me write the word prime in here. There are prime numbers not included in this list. I.e. 7, 11, 13, and of course there are plenty others. So a number like 77 is not prime, right? Why? Yeah, because it is 7 times 11. It's divisible by 7 and 11. Um, but it's not divisible by any in his list, right? There's something else about his list that's weird. Anybody know what it is? Yeah, so can you give me an example of a number there that's not prime, Lisa? Four. Four or ten. Okay, any either of those. Eight as well, right? Why is that important to realize? I mean, if a number is divisible by 10, then that's cool, right? It would be composite. Yeah, there you go. Some of those numbers, the ones that you're saying are composite numbers in his list, end up being silly to check, right? Is it silly to check if a number is divisible by 10? Yeah, why? Because you'd have gotten to five if you started at the bottom of the list already, right? You would have already passed through two and five, which are the factors of ten anyway. So you end up sort of wasting your time with some of his options, correct? So this is sort of bullet point number one. Bullet point number two is there are unnecessary is what they really are, right? numbers in his list. Um, and for example, we said the number 10. You could use 8 or 4 or whatever you like. Example 10. Because if you test with 2 and 5, You found information. I, sh I shouldn't say it that way. Let me say it a little bit differently. Hang on. If you test divisibility by 10, it would 
also be divisible by 2 and 5. That's better. Right? It's unnecessary. There's no reason to test the numbers that are already composite numbers because they break down into primes and you could have tested their individual prime components already. Now, that's not to say that if you saw a number and you knew it was divisible by 10 that you wouldn't just say, oh yeah, it's composite because it divides by 10. That's fine. But you could also just look at it and say it's, it's even or it's divisible by 5. You know, the prime factorization of it would work just as well. All right.